In this BME 271 lecture, we will continue our discussion of displacement encoding sensors uh, by, by talking about rotary encoders and inductive displacement sensors. So recall the different types of displacement and position sensors we've been talking about. Uh, in previous lectures, we talked about uh, resistive. In the previous lecture, we talked about resistive encoders. Today, we're going to talk about optical encoders. Uh, you guys had a problem on capacitive encoders on the homework, on one of your recent homeworks. Uh, and then today we're going to also talk about inductive encoders, and in a subsequent lecture we'll talk about triangulation and time of flight. So first, rotary encoders. Rotary encoders measure angular displacements. And specifically, we'll be talk looking at optical encoders, which generally comprise a glass disc attached to a shaft. I'll show you guys a picture of, uh, or I'll draw you guys a picture of that. And as that shaft is turned by the object, uh, whose angular position we want to measure, the disc is going to spin, and it's the, it's the spinning of that disc that we detect. So the disc itself is marked with opaque and translucent sections, that is, optically opaque and translucent sections. And those sections either block or pass light that's coming from an LED on one side of it. So the simplest type of optical encoder is what's called an incremental optical encoder. And I can draw a schematic of this. we have a disk that is attached to a spinning shaft that in the shaft itself then is is attached to whatever it is that we're actually trying to measure the angular position of and this disk has these windows on it, these light and dark windows. So I can draw these little windows along here. And on one side of the disk, we place an LED. And on the other side, we have a photodiode to detect light from the LED. And of course, if a window passes by, then light is allowed to come from the LED, pass from the LED all the way to the photodiode. So then you get some larger signal in the photodiode, and when the window passes and you, then you're in an opaque region uh, of the disk, then you'll get low signal, signal from the photodiode. So as the shaft rotates, we get some output voltage from the photodiode circuit that would look like this. It's essentially going to be a square wave whose frequency is going to depend on the, the uh, rate at which the shaft is rotating. So you get these dark regions in here and light regions represented in the V-out waveform. And from that V-out waveform, we can measure the angle through which the wheel turns over some period of time by counting the number of light-to-dark transitions. So what we do here is we take this V-out waveform, and we count the number of edges, essentially. So here's an edge. One, two, three, four, five, six, and so on. This numbers would go to a counter. And this is a function of time, just to be totally clear there. And then 
that's and so that's how we determine how 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 fast it's going and how far it's gone. Uh, and the angular resolution of that measurement then is determined by the number of transitions on the wheel. So the resolution in degrees is going to be given by three, 360 divided by the number of transitions. Since we have 360 degrees in one revolution, and we also have n transitions uh, in the, uh, uh, over one revolution. And of course, the number of transitions is equal to uh, two times the number of, total number of windows. Sorry, windows with an S. So this latter equality uh, follows from the fact, this latter equality being the, this bottom one, follows from the fact that each window comprises two transitions. All right, so two times the number of windows gives you the number of transitions. And we should note here that this assumes that the this assumes that the windows in, in opaque regions have uh, the same width, angular, the same angular width over the wheel. Okay, so that measurement that I just described can tell you the total angle through which you have gone in any given period of time, but how can you tell which direction, which angular direction you're going, which way the, the wheel is spinning? So to do that, you need what's called quadrature detection. Auto, auto correct. Okay, so to achieve quadrature detection, you place two LED detector pairs right next to each other, and so that their spacing is less than one window width. So here you have two, a row of LEDs on one side. Here we're looking down at the disc. We're going to be looking down at the disc. So you'd have LED A and LED B. And here's a window, and here's an equally an equal width opaque region, and here's another opaque region. So these are two opaque regions, and this is a window I've depicted here in the middle. And then here are the two detectors sitting right next to each other. Our photodiodes. And of course, if there's a window, if, they pa if a window passes by, then the light can make it from the LEDs to the detectors. And so if the wheel is moving this way, then you're going to have detector B leading detector A. The signal from B is going to lead that from A. So if I draw signal B here, and then I draw signal A on top of that, it's going to be a bit delayed. Let's see. So B is going to hit the B is going to hit the dark region first, and so A is going to be a bit delayed from that. So here I'm drawing the dashed line as A, and the solid line is B. Okay. So as we move into this dark region, because the wheel is moving this way. B is going to go to that dark region first, so it's going to transition from light to dark before A will transition from light to dark. Okay, and on the other hand, if we are going this way, then the opposite will be true. So we will have, let's draw B again. the signal coming from sent from detector B and in this case we will have that A will lead okay so you can appreciate the difference between these two waveforms depending on which direction we're going Okay, so now we fully described the incremental encoder. Let's talk about its advantages. Uh, the first one is that it's quite simple. 
and can be high resolution. A high angular, a fine angular resolution, perhaps is better to say. Uh, it's they are linear. They have infinite range, meaning you can go through as many revolutions as you want, and as long as you keep counting the entire time, you can you can uh, keep track of the total angle that has gone through. They are also temperature insensitive, as opposed to potentiometers or, or other devices that might have some temperature coefficient. Uh, one disadvantage is that if you turn the power off, then you lose your absolute precision is lost, or your absolute position, sorry. So if you turn it off, then you lose the absolute position because you don't know where you started. Uh, that's that will be in contrast to the absolute optical, the absolute uh, angular encoder that we'll talk about next. Uh, and also, if an error occurs, if you if you somehow miss one of the transitions, for example, all accuracy is lost. That will that will affect all subsequent. Uh, that will affect all subsequent measurements. All subsequent measurements will be off by that amount. So to address the uh, incremental encoder's weaknesses, we uh, people folks have also developed absolute optical encoders. And these are formed from several concentric incremental encoders, essentially, each with a different number of windows. And so what you get is a unique optical pattern at each angular position. You have a different number of windows and of, in each concentric circle, and so each, at each angular position you get a different, uh, different optical pattern. Uh, so that means that each angular position uh, can be encoded with a unique, a unique, unique binary value, essentially. Uh, and so in that binary value, each circle represents one bit in that binary number. Oh, not a but, a bit. And so one source, and then you have one source and one detector for each circle. So each, each circle requires its own source and detector. So what you get is a device that looks something like this. I'm not going to draw all the windows on there, but I can at least draw the... Uh, I can draw all the circles. So there's one circle. There's two circles. And there are three circles that I've drawn here. And so we have one LED for each circle. Okay, so here are your LEDs on the left side. Here are your photodiodes on the right side. So for example, let's say that we have three bits, or three concentric circles. And so this is going to give us three bits. So we will have a total of two to the third is equal to eight states. Right? There will be eight angular locations we can encode. So your resolution then is going to be 360 divided by 8, 360 degrees divided by 8, which is equal to 45 degrees. So I'm going to draw this whole sucker here. Here's your big wheel looking at it head on. It's going to have 8 sections, 8 pie slices. Okay, 
and we're going to have three circles. Okay, so then that'll be dark, that'll be dark, that'll be dark. Uh, let's see, half of the inside overall will be dark. Then you'll have so you'll have two two uh, two window or just one window in the innermost circle. You'll have two windows in the middle circle, and you'll have four windows in the outermost circle. And with this pattern, we get a unique light and dark pattern at every position, in every slice, essentially. And so here. And we can call this our least significant bit. It changes the most. And the innermost circle would be the most significant bit, MSB. So the values we get here, for example, would be 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0. 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, and 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1, 1. Okay, so as we do, we'll discuss their advantages and disadvantages. Uh, you get one advantage is that you get the actual position, not just in a position referenced to a previous position as with the incremental encoder. Another advantage is that you get uh, continuous measurements. That is, you can switch on the encoder at any point and know exactly where you are, any point in time and know, on, know exactly where you are. So power interruptions are not a problem. They're very accurate. And there's no startup procedure, like reset it, resetting a counter, as you would have to do with the incremental encoder. Their disadvantages include, of course, that you need more detectors and transmitters, so you have more complex circuitry, and then you've got to figure out how to process the relative voltages coming out of the uh, photodiodes. They're heavier than incremental encoders. They'll be more expensive than incremental encoders. And they can break somewhat easily because these, they have these glass disks, right? lots of holes in them essentially. Nevertheless though these encoders are frequently used in robotics and to sense angles of surgical instruments. And so here's a comparison of incremental a, a figure showing glass disks for incremental and absolute optical encoders. And of course you can see that the incremental one, we just are making measurements along this outermost ring. So you have all your light and dark transitions out there. Whereas the absolute encoder, we have many, many rings, concentric rings. The innermost one is this one that I'm mousing over here. And it has uh, two transitions. Then you can see, as I drew before, that we have four transitions in the next one. 8, 16, 32, and so on out to the outermost ring. So you can hear that the, see that the total number of bits here is, looks like it is uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 bits uh, on this encoder. It might be that we just can't see what the top one is. So now we move on to inductive displacement sensors. So again, recall the inductance equations. We, equation. We have that inductance of an inductor is equal to n squared 
the number of turns squared times this geometry factor G times the magnetic permeability uh, through which the magnetic flux is passing of, or of the medium through which the magnetic flux is passing mu. So again N here is the number of turns G is the geometry factor and mu is the magnetic permeability. Okay, now each of these variables can be varied in response to displacement and thereby used to measure that displacement, causing that change in that variable. The linear variable differ differential transformer is a device we talked about previously and that is widely used in research and, and clinic. Uh, to measure pressure, displacement, and force in various ways. So here's a schematic, a circuit schematic that we looked at previously when we were talking about inductance to voltage conversion. Uh, so here we have a primary transformer. So let me make sure that these are more visible. This is label A, that's B, that is C, that is D, and that is E. So the, the, primary, trans the primary winding is on the left, and the secondary windings are on the right, there are two of them. And then you have this slug, this uh, high mu slug, or an iron slug, that's attached to our stimulus that is moving in and out uh, of, this, of the region uh, through which the flux is connecting, is linking the, uh, the primary and secondary coils. And of course, if, if, the, if the high mu slug is, is, cl is closer to uh, coil C, or the, the, the top winding, then we'll have better flux linkage between between the, the primary and the top secondary and so you'll get more signal out of the top secondary uh, than you will out of the bottom secondary and vice versa. So what you end up getting here is a plot that looks like this for V sub C D. It'll have a V shape depending on the position of the slug if this is X equals zero in the center and then if that's X then V sub C D will look like this. Right? And here's a picture of an actual device where you have the high mu slug in the middle there. That's, that's the, the blue, uh, blue device there. And the middle winding is the primary, and then the two outer windings are the secondary. So you can see if the slug overlaps one or the other, it's going gonna, it's gonna to help couple the magnetic flux better or worse uh, to that one. Okay, so again, the coupling between the coils is changed by the motion of this high mu slug between them. So when the and when the slug is symmetrically placed, then we have that the voltage difference between the two outputs, which is equal to VCD VCE minus VDE, is equal to zero. But when the slug is asymmetrically placed, then the primary couple is going the primary coil is going to couple more to one secondary coil than the other, so that one of the voltages is going to be bigger than, than the other, and we're going to get a non-zero voltage output. And to measure angular displacement using uh, an inductive sensor, we have what are called rotary variable differential transformers. And so schematically, these, this would look like this. You'd have this voltage generator, this signal generator in the middle that is attached to a primary winding. and it is spinning. And oriented around that you're going to have these secondary coils and one squeezed in up top here too. Okay, so you're going to have, let's see, plus, minus, and 
plus minus. So this first one we'll call v1, v2, v3, and v4. And we'll reference this, we'll call this 0 degrees, and then this would be 45. So the positive rotation is going, going clockwise. So the primary coil is mounted on this spinning shaft in this device. And if we look at the output signals coming from V1, V2, V3, and V4, we would get something like the following as the shaft rotates. So let's see, when it's at 90 degrees, we'd have maximum signal in V2. So this is V2's curve. When we are at 180 degrees, then we'll get maximum signal from V3. So that would be V3's curve. When we're at 270, it'll be V4 that is maximized. And 360, which is the same as 0, is going to have V1 maximized. So V3, V4, V1, and of course at 0 we also have V1 maximized. So the signal in each secondary coil is maximized when the primary coil lines up with it. And by looking at the amplitude of the signal coming out of, the, coming out of these different voltage, uh, these different uh, secondary windings, we can determine what the angular position is of the primary coil in shaft. Okay, so we'll finish up this lecture with this uh, discussion of advantages and disadvantages. Uh, one advantage of LVDTs is that they are very linear with sensitivities of about 0 0.5 to 2 millivolts per 0 0.01 millimeters of motion per volt of primary voltage, since of course the output voltage depends on the primary voltage, is linear, linearly proportional to the primary voltage. RVDTs are highly sensitive, um, and LVDTs have significantly higher sensitivity than strain gauges. Uh, the RVDT, again, uh, has allows you to do infinite rotations. You can keep spinning the shaft and getting a readout continuously. Uh, and they are very rugged. These devices are very rugged. A couple disadvantages. One is that they are hard to build since they involve these moving parts. And it's going to be difficult, as, as we know, uh, inductors are notoriously non-ideal. And another disadvantage is that at least the LVDT requires phase sensitive detection to resolve the sign of displacement of the, or of position. Phase sensitive detection is required to resolve the sign of position, uh, at least for the uh, LVDT.